guys. Welcome everyone uh, out there. Uh, we're still unfortunately physically disconnected here, but um, virtually connecting here with uh, staying safe, hopefully everyone. And um, you know, I think the weather is getting nicer and hopefully people are getting out in, into nature and socially connecting a little bit. Um, so excited to continue our movers and shakers series um, with uh, our, my co-host, uh, Ben Stetcher. Um, and uh, I've kind of left it a little bit up to him to figure out kind of what what we should do, how, where we should take this. And um, he's uh, really had a background in education, but really as um, a person living with uh, Parkinson's has really owned his own sort of education and into science and basic science even. And um, I'm uh, uh, impressed by his knowledge base. And honestly, I think he's learned more just in his own self-study than I learned in medical school and, and in my undergrad. So, um, so I'm excited to have Ben, um, you know, choose our guests. And I had a great chat with Megan uh, Duffy, who um, is joining us today. Um, Dr. Duffy is a uh, doing um, some amazing research, but she also is very embodied in the cause of Parkinson's. Um, she told me about her grandmother who had the disease and had inspired her to do this research. And she's really excited to connect with patients. And um, I think uh, this will be an interesting conversation um, with a very cool participants here. So, and we do want to, you know, encourage the audience to participate and we'll try to keep it, you know, at uh, the level of, um, you know, a relatively late audience, but, you know, these are some really cool concepts. So definitely excited to hear from Ben. Uh, ben, do you want to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Duffy a little bit more formally? Sure. Thank you, Indu. Good to see you. And hi, everybody. Great to be with you again here today. Um, so yeah, from the beginning of my journey, I kind of had some big questions in mind about what we understand about this disease, how we know what we think we know, and how we test some of the new therapies that we have in the pipeline. How is it that we actually get to the point where we have a drug that makes it into a clinic uh, that researchers and doctors are comfortable with? And these questions often lead to more questions and those questions lead to more questions and you go down this whole rabbit hole uh, and it can seem never ending at times, but thankfully there are people like Megan out there, Dr. Duffy, who's been working on these things for a lot longer than I've been asking these questions or have even known of the existence of this disease. Um, and it's, so I, I first met her about, I think, what was it, five or so years ago on this journey that I've been on. And we've been in pretty close contact ever since. She's been my kind of go-to resource whenever I have any stupid little science question that I need to ask. I, she's always been uh, willing to uh, be patient with me and guide me through a lot of the, <laughs> basic things that I need to know. And she's a big part of the reason why I know a lot of the things that I do know. So I'm very grateful to her. And I wanted to bring her on because I think that she has a pretty unique perspective on this as well, having worked with a lot of the a variety of the different models that researchers use to study and to understand this disease a little bit better. Uh, so without much more, without further ado, I'll hand the floor over to Dr. Megan Duffy, who will walk us through some of the intricacies of models that we use to understand Parkinson's disease. Thank you for that introduction, Ben. Um, so I will go ahead and share. You guys see that? Uh oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cause I can't see you guys at the moment. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, um, you know, to, to kind of preface this, um, I want this to be very conversational and I want it to be a discussion. I want, you know, anyone to get their questions answered. Um, I also saw a few familiar names um, that are attending that are also scientists that I've worked with previously or that I've been in touch with. Um, so would be happy for them to weigh in on any of these things too. So um, the talk is uh, Ben's idea, actually, models of Parkinson's, how we know what we think we know. And as they alluded to, um, my interest in Parkinson's began uh, when I was in high school and my grandmother, who I was very close to, um, would spend weekends at her house pretty much every weekend we were together. Um, she was diagnosed with Parkinson's when I was a senior in high school. And um, all I really knew about it at the time was that, you know, the typical symptoms that you read about in textbooks, like tremor, um, problems with balance, um, I didn't really know much more than that. And I knew that there were drugs that could help alleviate the symptoms and you could live with it, you know, relatively normally for a number of years. 
Um, unfortunately, um, she didn't fit that typical Parkinson's, you know, um, phenotype that we read about in textbooks. Um, she progressed relatively quickly. Um, after about two years, she started having really severe cognitive problems as well as speech impairment. Um, and she eventually progressed to pretty severe dementia. And, you know, that was the most troublesome symptom of them all. Um, and that took a really big toll on my family. My mom was, you know, my mom's here. Um, she was kind of the main caregiver who took her to all of her appointments and their relationship really suffered. Um, with the personality changes, with the frustration. And my grandma was a very social, uh, social butterfly, very fierce and independent. Um, and after she got her diagnosis that she kind of, you know, clammed up and isolated herself. And that was, you know, she was scared to go to the grocery store because she thought people would see her tremoring and think she was an alcoholic. Um, so there was a lot of worry there and a lot of anxiety. Um, and the first medication that she was put on, she was in the very small percentage of people that have negative psych psychiatric effects like hallucinations. Um, so eventually that medication got stopped and the hallucinations stopped, but the anxiety that had kind of, you know, been initiated by that drug never really went away. Um, so I think it was a combination of isolating herself. Um, she was also diabetic and there was uh, an article that just came out last week, a new paper um, linking diabetes to faster progression to dementia and Parkinson's disease. Um, and she had also had a really severe case of shingles in her 50s. So her body had this, you know, prolonged systemic immune response, which can also be linked to both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So I can only really speculate what caused it. Um, both of her parents lived well into their 90s with no health issues. Um, so it really got me thinking, you know, what made her different than, you know, what we normally think of as Parkinson's. So um, I decided to go to graduate school to get my PhD. Um, I initially wanted to be a neurologist and um, kind of had a reality check with myself and I am an empath to a fault. Um, so I, I thought that that might not be the best route for me because I would take, you know, take things home with me. Um, and there I worked in Carol Swartwell's lab and my research was investigating um, when neuroinflammation happens in a pretty new model of Parkinson's at the time. So I did a lot of work in exclusively in rats. And then um, over the years, I, you know, my grandmother passed away in 2014, but for me, it was still really important to stay in touch um, with the wider Parkinson's community. And I met so many amazing people that were, you know, kind of taking this disease and diagnosis by the horns. Um, you know, I met Ben, who we talk almost daily. Um, he makes my brain hurt. He has amazing questions that, you know, have really caused me to question how we know what we think we know and how do we do science and are we asking the right questions? Um, so I've, you know, I'm an active member of Team Fox for the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, I do lots of their events. Um, I did a, an eight hour overnight Tough Mudder and raised two grand for Team Fox. That was a pretty ridiculous thing to do, but it was fun. Um, so I come at this from both, you know, I've, I've had an interest in the brain for a long time, um, but also I, you know, I always really keep this personal perspective um, in mind because it's easy to get lost in, you know, in your science and the day-to-day -day frustrations of, um, of doing lab work. So, Megan? Yes. A quick question, if you would like, if you could indulge me. <laughs> and this is also maybe for the scientists that are out there as well. Um, how many of them would you say are, what do you think, I guess I should say it again, how many of them would you say have that personal connection to the disease that they're studying? And how do you think that influences how they study what they're studying? 
I would say with how common, if you take Parkinson's and um, Alzheimer's, dementia, really, they're so prevalent that I would, I would guess, you know, most scientists at least know somebody. Um, you know, what that degree of connection is, I'm not sure, but I think more recently, um, as more patient advocates also get involved in these discussions with scientists, more and more kind of getting out of that mindset of studying a single target and we're going to, you know, take that target from cells to animals to clinical trials and it's just one thing. I think it's um, patient advocacy and just, you know, reaching out to scientists and getting involved has kind of changed our perspective a little bit. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Awesome. Um, and also, I'll state as a disclaimer, um, any of the views or opinions I express are my own, um, and they're also ever changing as, you know, as science changes what we know, um, and don't represent those of NIH, so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> Um, so some of you um, may have seen this already, but just to go over some common terms that I use, um, the first one is Lewy bodies. So these are found in um, the brains of a majority of people with Parkinson's disease, and there are there are accumulations of different proteins and different parts of the cell as well as lipids, um, and these are really the basis for the Brock staging hypothesis and where these pop up in the brain. The next thing you'll hear me talk about a lot is alpha-synuclein. So this is a protein that's, it, it accounts for about 1% of total protein in the brain, which is a huge amount when you consider how many different proteins there are. Um, and it's important for normal function. So it's, it's important for helping membranes in different parts of the cell bend and form, you know, these curved structures. And that also um, helps ensure normal synaptic transmission. So what that is, is synaptic transmission is how neurons communicate with each other, um, mostly through neurotransmitters. The thing is, um, it wasn't discovered until actually the late 90s that um, the major component of these Lewy bodies is actually this alpha-synuclein protein, and we'll talk a lot about that later. Next thing is my favorite brain cell. Um, these are microglia. They're the brain's resident immune cells and kind of the first line of defense against infection, viruses, bacteria. Um, but they've also been shown to be increased and have a more pro-inflammatory profile in Parkinson's disease. Um, like everything else in, in the brain and in disease, it's all about balance. So, you know, some pro-inflammation pro is helpful for wound healing. But in the case of diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, when these cells are in a pro-inflammatory state for a long period of time that can contribute to, you know, any damage that's done to neurons. The next is induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs. So these are um, cells that are taken from patients and they're either taken from skin cells or from blood cells and using a combination of different proteins and viral vectors to carry those proteins, we're able to revert these back into a stem cell that has the potential to become any cell type. So if you want it to become a heart cardiomyocyte, you can direct it that way. You could direct the same cell to become a dopamine neuron. Um, two terms that are talked about in reference to models are in vitro and in vivo. So in vitro means that, you know, an experiment is performed or taking place either in a test tube or in a culture dish somewhere outside of a living organism. Whereas in vivo is um, our experiments that are performed usually inside of an animal. Organoid is a relatively um, new field in, in the last probably seven years, I think. Um, so these are little, you know, basically blobs <laughs> of cells that are, um, they're derived from these iPSCs and they're cultured in a 3D um, 
type of plate and with different addition of different proteins that we know are important for directing development and directing patterning, um, we can develop these organoids into different brain regions. Um, they're also used for many other things uh, like liver diseases, cancer, et cetera. And then the last one here is tyrosine hydroxylase, which you'll hear me refer to a lot when we talk about animal models. Um, so TH is the rate limiting enzyme that converts L-tyrosine to L-dopa. And that happens before L-dopa is converted to dopamine. And so when we look at tissue from either animals or human brain, we use this um, TH protein to mark and visualize our dopamine neurons. Some neuroanatomy, um, just to get us all on the same page, um, there's two regions that are primarily, you know, the focus of Parkinson's disease and what causes symptoms. So in a normal brain, um, you have the substantia nigra, which is down here, kind of at the top of the brain stem. And the substantia nigra literally means black substance. And so it's Dopamine neurons in this area have a pigment called neuromelanin, and um, these neurons will project to the putamen and the caudate, which in humans are two separate um, regions that are separated by um, myelin or axon bundles. In the Parkinson's brain, what happens is those neuromelanin containing dopamine neurons die off. So you see that loss of pigment right here and the projections that they um, have that go to the putamen and the caudate, those also start to die off. So this is where dopamine is actually released and has its effects. And so you have you know, both cell loss in the substantia nigra, and then you have loss of these, um, loss of innervation of these fibers in the um, putamen and the caudate. Something to note, um, so these are also collectively referred to as the striatum. Um, in mice and in rodents, these two regions are basically one big region. And then this is just another image um, showing you kind of a more, um, to give you more anatomical reference of where the substantia nigra neurons, their cell bodies re reside. And then they have these really long projections that um, go to the caudate and the putamen where they release dopamine. Megan, a quick question there. Yes. So one thing I often hear from patients is why can't we treat this disease like a hip replacement surgery? We have these neurons that we know are dying. Why don't we, why can't we just go in and replace those neurons uh, and put back what's lost? Right. So um, that was the train of thought. At one time, it seems really simple. You know, we've lost dopamine. So let's take, you know, the first um, cell replacement trial was using fetal transplants. And um, the thing that it really fails to take into account is in the Parkinson's brain, um, the underlying biology changes have likely been going on for decades before you have symptoms. So you're essentially putting these new, fresh, young baby brain cells into an environment that likely has a lot of inflammation around it, that has protein aggregation, and also the, the you know, new neurons that you're tra transplanting in, you know, within the context of that environment may not form the right connections that the neurons they're trying to replace did. If that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Cool. Um, so this is a very brief history to kind of give you an idea of where we've been and where we're going. Um, and I'll try to go through this relatively quickly. Um, so this first period is really when Parkinson's was first discovered. Um, in 1817, James Parkinson wrote his essay on the shaking palsy, which was based off, you know, people he observed on the street. Um, and later on, some uh, neurologists really started noticing already in the 1870s that are, there are different subtypes 
So there are people who have a more tremor predominant form or people that have more um, rigidity and slowness of movement. And then in the late 1800s, um, the link between tremor and substantia nigra was first brought up. In 1912 and 1919 is where um, the first observation of Lewy bodies was made in um, post-mortem brain tissue from people suffering from post-encephalitic PD following the Spanish flu. From the 1950s to around the 1980s, I kind of refer to this as the dopamine area era. So um, the first key findings were published linking dopamine depletion to Parkinson's-like symptoms in rabbits. Um, and then it was found that, you know, dopamine loss in the substantia nigra, as well as in the putamen and caudate, was observed in PD patients. Um, and this is also when the Hone and Yar staging scale was published. And the, you know, time point everyone likes to refer to, mostly in frustration, um, L-DOPA was first approved, I think, in 1969 or 1968. Um, so, and that is still our gold standard of symptomatic treatment. In the 1980s, um, MPTP was discovered to cause dopamine neuron loss. Um, and some of you may have read this book, Case of the Frozen Addicts. This was discovered when several heroin addicts had shown up in the hospital with Parkinson's-like symptoms. And then the link between all of these patients making the synthetic drug um, was made and they found out that, you know, this toxic byproduct is what caused their Parkinson's symptoms. Then in 1985 um, was the first fetal cell transplant. And then in 1990, the, um, one of the mechanisms of MPTP induced Parkinsonism was discovered. Um, and this is a decrease in the mitochondrial complex one, which is part of the electron transport chain. And this is, you know, this whole process is involved in energy production of, um, and maintaining balance of energy in the cell. So the 90s is where things really started to take off. Um, in 1995, deep brain stimulation was first proven effective as a treatment option. And, you know, in the mid to late 90s is where we really get into genetics. So um, mutations in the alpha-synuclein gene were discovered as the first familial cause of PD. And in 1998, um, it was also discovered that alpha-synuclein is a major component of Lewy bodies in both genetic and idiopathic Parkinson's cases. So um, it wasn't just in these families that had this specific mutation. So this is where the idea of alpha-synuclein being causative in you know, all forms of Parkinson's disease really came about. And you'll notice the 2000s is where things start happening really rapidly. Um, and I think this is really to be attributed to the completion of the Human Genome Project. So once that was completed, we were able to do a lot of large scale um, genetic studies to identify different risks, um, risk genes associated with developing Parkinson's. And so, um, you know, in 2011, a genome wide association study identified 11 different risk loci for Parkinson's. Um, and Already um, in 2019, we've made it up to 90 different risk, risk genes. So um, these genes normally will not cause Parkinson's by themselves. By themselves, um, there are small mutations that you know, if added together or in combination with environmental factors, can cause PD. So there's we've we've come quite a long way considering you know alpha synuclein in Parkinson's wasn't discovered until the late 90s, um, but it's equally as frustrating that the um, gold standard treatment option is still you know from the late 60s early 70s. So um, how do we study neurodegeneration? Um, we use a wide variety of models from flies and worms to rodents to non-human primates um, to patient-derived cells. And you know, a lot of 
what spurs the work in these models either comes from patient samples like blood or CSF or post-mortem um, human brain tissue, as well as human genetics. So we really try to take, you know, the data from our human subjects and then try to reproduce that in animals or cells. So this quote is um, something that a scientist I really look up to presented in a talk maybe last year, and it really stuck with me. Um, all models are wrong, but some may be useful. All models are approximations. Assumptions, whether implied or clearly stated, are never exactly true. So that's something to keep in mind as I'm talking, and you'll kind of notice a, a pattern, I hope, um, by the end. So there's two main classes of models that we use to study neurodegenerative disease. And the first type is in vitro. So these are the ones that are performed in a test tube or a dish. Um, cells can be derived from patients. So these are iPSCs that we can then convert to whatever cell type we want. Um, these studies in general are pretty fast. They enable live imaging of cells, and I'll show some videos of that later. They're performed under very controlled conditions, which experimentally is um, a positive, but it's it doesn't translate as well to um, human disease and all of the factors that kind of go into that. Um, they can be repeatable without being cost prohibitive. You can study the biophysics and the structure of different proteins. Um, the experiments are generally pretty short term, which is great, um, but they usually only look at a single cell type at a time. Sometimes you'll see studies where they culture um, neurons with astrocytes, which are support cells, and microglia, which are immune cells, to kind of more um, recapitulate the, the environment that we see in the intact human brain. And then the other type is in vivo. So these are models that are performed in a living organism. Um, these are good because it's, you know, they're performed under physiological conditions. So the neurons are in their natural environment. They're not being grown on plastic without, you know, support cells and the blood brain barrier and, you know, all of those types of things. You can do behavior in these animals, which you can't do in a test tube. Um, you know, the they can be expensive though uh, to maintain. They're very time consuming. Um, you can look at both on and off target drug effects and they're usually required before any drug is moved from the lab to a clinical trial. Megan? Yes. One, uh, one thing I'd like to hear a little bit more about, I guess, is um the kind of implicit biases that come about as a result of what a scientist happens to be working on. I know that prior to um, my own kind of journey into this, I think I thought of scientists as some, as almost like beyond human, like people that have no biases and are able to objectively look at anything and kind of discern the <laughs> truth. But I've learned that they're very human, the scientists are human as well, and that they yeah. often have these biases that drive them forward. And you see people that have been working in one cell, one model type or another, they kind of claim that that model type is the best to be using for all of our studies going forward. I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what you've observed as you've kind of gone through the field and gone through the different kinds of models. Um, I will say you are exactly right. So um, first, scientists are humans. Um, you know, we have things that we believe and things we don't believe. And, um, you know, there can be, a lot of rivalry between labs, which is not healthy for anybody. Um, and yeah, there there are some labs who, for one reason or another, whether it's, you know, they've been working in this model since the beginning of their career and their whole career, you know, is based on this one model will not change what they're doing. Um, but I think uh, more people are starting to realize the benefit of not just using, you know, one model, but using, you know, going from testing something in a cancer cell to an iPSC derived neuron to some animal model and, you know, kind of making sure that their results replicate across, um, you know, I think there is a benefit to using multiple models um, because each one has their strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I've definitely observed 
you know, I've gotten reviews back on papers um, when I was studying inflammation in a new model and talking about why for this purpose, it's better for studying neural inflammation than what else is out there. And I got a very long, um, kind of emotionally charged reviewer response. Um, and that was really tough to deal with because it, you know, at some point, every model is going to be irrelevant, you know. Um, a lot of them, you know, the classes and models I talk about were at one time the best thing since sliced bread, and they were going to be the answer and, you know, lead to a cure for Parkinson's. And here we are all these years later, and that hasn't happened yet. Um, so, yeah, it, it certainly does happen. Um, I think now with the technology that's developed, especially with um, the genetic side of things, it's easier to do more unbiased types of experiments, um, but the funding for those is lacking. Um, you'll hear them called fishing expeditions because you kind of just go out there and throw out a net and see what you get. Um, but for grant purposes, you know, unless you're at an institute or somewhere like NIH with your own intramural funding, um, people like to see, you know, very hypothesis driven studies. Um, I submitted, you know, a graduate student form of an NIH grant three separate times in grad school. And each time it got you know, it got scored, but it got sent back saying it was too descriptive, um, which is a problem. You know, we need the descriptive things to, you know, form a hypothesis, right? So yeah, in short, um, you know, there is bias in science, whether we like it or not. Um, I'm guilty of it. Everybody's guilty of it. But I think there are a lot more methods now that kind of at least attempt to take that bias out. So um, first, I'm going to go over some major classes of animal models um, and kind of what their strengths and their weaknesses are. Um, and this is definitely not a comprehensive review. Um, you know, we're already a half hour in. <laughs> so, um, you know, if I go too fast, I am happy to send these out um, afterwards, or you can email me and ask questions or ask questions while I'm talking. Um, so with that, um, most, most of the animal models that are used for Parkinson's research, research are rodents. Um, so there's, you know, it's almost pretty evenly divided between mice and rats. Um, there are some non-mammalian models, which I won't talk about, like um, Drosophila, which are flies, as well as C. elegans, which are these tiny microscopic worms. Um, and even those have their advantages for um, different types of experiments, but are also limited. And then um, non-human primates comprise, you know, 10%. And a lot of that is to do with, you know, ethical reasons and also having the infrastructure and the money to do those, those types of experiments, which can be very um, expensive. So why is there this, you know, pretty equal divide between rats and mice and why are they, you know, accounting for the majority of the animal models we use? Um, so rats are in general more genetically similar to humans. They have greater synaptic, plast um, sorry, <laughs> greater synaptic complexity, which means the, um, the connections they form between neurons are, you know, more numerous and you know, in general, more complex. Rats also exhibit a lot of fine motor behaviors that mice don't, so they're really great for behavioral testing. And then their size also lends itself to more tissue collection. So here's, you know, a cross section of a rat and a mouse brain. You can see the rat brain is a lot bigger. Um, you can also take uh, cerebral spinal fluid from rats um, and have enough to run whatever assay on inflammatory markers or proteins that you want. Mice are generally preferred in studies where you want to introduce a genetic mutation um, or you want to knock out a gene to see, you know, what the loss of function of that gene actually does to contribute or protect against disease. 
So there are some features I think that are important to keep in mind when you're looking at, you know, what animal model is used. And while Parkinson's is really variable um, from person to person, there are, you know, some features that are pretty common. So motor impairment is, you know, the obvious one. Um, protracted time course. So Parkinson's likely develops over many, many years or even decades. Um, and as I said before, you know, this is going on and it's not until you've reached a certain number, certain percentage of cell loss in the substantia nigra or dopamine loss in the striatum that you start to see symptoms. There's also inflammation that's seen in postmortem brains of um, Parkinson's patients is, and inflammation's also been observed um, using PET scanning, which is relatively new. Um, Alpha-synuclein pathology, which occurs in some but not all cases. Um, it's also used as a postmortem um, diagnostic criteria. Non-motor symptom impairment, um, so things like vocalization deficits, um, anxiety and depression, lost sense of smell, gastrointestinal issues, sleep and cognition are also you know, important features that I know are really bothersome. Um, and then also, in addition to having cell loss in this, you know, very specific circuit, there are multiple brain regions and multiple cell types involved. Another question here. Yes. What, how would you describe the symptoms that a mouse has and how close do you think they come to replicating what you've seen in humans? I have videos on that in a bit. Um, so tell me to shut up next time. <laughs> So we can look at, um, you know, mouse and rat motor behavior and anxiety um, a couple different ways. One of the tests we use is the open field test. So this is where we just put a rat in a box um, and we record, you know, we can use a tracking system to record every single movement they make. Um, so you can tell whether an animal is just overall moving less if it's spending more time in the center of the box or if it's, you know, kind of clinging to the walls, which is suggestive of anxiety. Um, we can use the rotor rod, which is um, a test where you have literally a rod that's rotating and you increase the speed gradually and mice that have motor impairment tend to fall off quicker um, than those that don't. And then there's also a bunch of forelimb asymmetry tests. So if you lose one side of the substantia nigra, the, um, the opposite limb is going to be impaired. Um, and this happens in human Parkinson's as well, and then eventually progresses to being bilateral. Um, so I do have some videos on the cylinder task um, in a little bit. There's but, also a question about whether dyskinesia is seen in, in the rats as well. That's a really good question. Um, so in certain models that have lost, you know, 60 to 80 percent of their dopamine in the striatum, that's enough that that's enough loss that if you give those animals L-dopa, they're responsive to L-dopa. And so um, one of them, you know, two of the models actually, 6-hydroxydopamine, and MPTP, which are neurotoxins, both are L-DOPA responsive um, and both are actually used to study the biology underlying L-DOPA induced dyskinesias. And there's a whole, you know, standardized rating scale for that. Um, and I have several colleagues at MSU that have really focused on that. Um, but some people are like, you know, it's a rat, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not a human. Um, so there's, there's that caveat too. Um, in this, this image, this is what um, a substantia nigra looks like um, in increasing years post-diagnosis. Um, so a control patient, um, you can see, has a lot of those neurons with that neuromelanin pigment in it. And then as the years post-diagnosis progress, you see gradual loss of those dopamine neurons. And similarly, um, in the striatum where these dopamine neurons project, um, you can see this gradual decrease in the amount of tyrosine hydroxylase there. And so, you know, after four years after diagnosis, the striatum is, you know, virtually devoid of, of any TH. And this will come back up later. 
Um, so one of the first, you know, classic models of Parkinson's disease came from MPTP, which um, I alluded to earlier, was discovered in, um, I think, San Francisco. And it was the result of these patients who came in, they had no connection to each other, but all had recently used a new form of synthetic heroin. Um, and something happened during the, you know, drug creation process that produced this toxin. Um, and it was later found out that um, it was a derivative of MPTP, so it was a toxic byproduct. And so all of these patients also had all of the motor features of Parkinson's, um, and they had an immediate um, response to L-DOPA. So there is this link between this MPTP molecule um, with dopamine loss and also Parkinson's symptoms. So um, people then decided, okay, let's you know use this in rodents and see like how exactly it works. Um, so there's two main neurotoxins that are used, um, 6-hydroxydopamine and then MPTP. Um, rats are less sensitive to MPTP, so it's not used in them as much. Um, these neurotoxicants can be administered either intracerebrally, cerebrally, um, so they're injected straight into the brain, or in the case of MPTP, you can administer, administer this peripherally via an IP injection or a subcutaneous injection. Um, and you can administer, administer it over you know, multiple days, multiple weeks to kind of have this chronic model. Um, so how do these neurotoxicants cause dopamine neuron loss? Um, these compounds or their toxic metabolites can interfere with parts of the electron transport chain, um, resulting in unstable oxygen molecules. Um, and these are some examples of reactive oxygen species. And if there aren't enough antioxidants in the cell um, to kind of break these down, then they accumulate and they lead to damage of DNA, of RNA, protein, and cellular organelles. So if those reactive oxygen species build up enough, this causes the cell to induce a programmed cell death pathway. So in these models, you get um, nigrostriatal loss, which is you know, dependent on the dose that you're administering. Um, and generally, you get 50 to 70% nigro loss and 70% striatal dopamine loss over two to four weeks. So here's an example of that. Um, this is 6-hydroxydopamine. And you can see, um, you know, this is a normal substantia nigra. And then here on this right side, you can see this is where 6-hydroxydopamine was administered and the nigra is virtually gone. Um, this is an example of MPTP being administered in a non-human primate. Same story, you have a beautiful pigmented substantia nigra here. And after administration of MPTP, the nigra is completely gone. Um, so these models are really great at reproducing um, several phenotypes or observable characteristics of Parkinson's, but um, they also have their limitations, which I get to. Um, so their magnitude of striatal dopamine loss and substantia nigra cell loss required to produce motor symptoms is similar to what's observed in humans. These animals are L-dopa responsive. Um, these models reproduce oxidative stress and mitochondrial respiration deficits. And these are also observed in postmortem human brain. Um, I have L-DOPA responsiveness twice. Um, so these, these models are really good for potentially screening symptomatic therapies. So here is, um, one second. Oops. Okay, so this first video is an example of cylinder cast. And this is in a rat. So they're placed in this clear plastic cylinder and they will rear up on their hind legs. And so at baseline, you can see this guy, when he stands up, 
he's using both paws to kind of brace himself and also to explore. And then this is the same animal 13 days after 6-hydroxydopamine was administered. And you can see he doesn't actually move or stand up a lot, but when he does, you can see that this paw, which is, you know, contralateral to where the injection side was, he doesn't really use it at all. Um, so this is often performed, you know, multiple times in the same animal over, you know, the duration of the experiment. So you can compare, you know, what the baseline was. So this animal, um, his forepaw use was pretty 50-50 um, between right and left. Whereas here, he only uses that contralateral side about 10% of the time. So, pause. Um, so these models have limitations. Um, you know, when they were first being used, um, people thought that, you know, these were very dopamine centric. Um, but degeneration happens over several weeks. And if you remember, Parkinson's takes years or decades to develop. There's often not involvement of multiple brain regions. Um, Alpha-synuclein pathology is not observed. Um, they don't mimic motor symptoms. And so it's a really poor model for disease modification studies. Um, however, before we knew that, they were used as, you know, a preclinical model that was the basis for many clinical trials. So that's why, you know, a lot of them have failed. Um, so these I'm going to kind of breeze through a little bit um, since it's already 149. Um, two other models that are used involve the um, pesticides and herbicides and insecticides Paraquat and Rotenone. And um, these both work kind of similarly to MPTP where they, um, they get you know, inside the brain, they have a, you know, MPTP like has this toxic metabolite. Um, and so once they get inside, they can affect the mitochondria and produce all of these reactive, reactive oxygen species, which can modify proteins. It can also cause the cells protein garbage disposal system to not function. Um, and that can lead to increased protein aggregation, which, you know, causes cellular dysfunction. Um, these are, these models are pretty much, they're, they're the most contested um, because they are really variable um, and they're really hard to reproduce. Um, for example, in rotenone models, up to 50% of the rats are for some reason resistant to rotenone. Um, there's also a high mortality rate because of systemic toxicity to the lungs and also the liver. Um, and these models have also been used um, to try and modify disease progression, um, but those trials again failed. Um, and these two drugs, which are now used as symptomatic treatments, um, failed in slowing the progression of the disease down. Um, so another, another type of model is using viral vectors to overexpress proteins. Um, and so your gene of interest is packaged into this um, viral vector. And essentially they're, they're safe because the parts of the virus that allow it to replicate, um, those are taken out. So um, the virus is allowed to still get into cells and eventually cause the cell to reproduce whatever gene you've packaged into it. Um, so some examples of how that's used is we can package alpha-synuclein into this viral vector and administer it into either the substantia nigra or the striatum. And so you can see here, um, all of these neurons have been targeted with the viral vector. They are overexpressing the alpha-synuclein protein. Um, and you can see that on the injected side, the nigra has, you know, substantially degenerated compared to the uninjected side. Megan? Yeah. 
I don't mean to interrupt you. I think this is all great, but we are running a little short on time. Yes. And there's one topic that I want, wanted to make sure that we had time for. So I don't know if you wanted to just breeze through a couple of slides or if we just should jump into that right now. What topic is it? Uh, about bridging gaps between the scientists, the patients and the doctors. And this is something I'd like both you and Indu to talk a little bit more about. Uh, one, the disconnect. Oh. One of the disconnects, oops, sorry. Yeah. One, um, I guess the disconnect between the communities that has kind of ex existed over time. Uh, just how much crosstalk is there between doctors and scientists? And then interjecting the patients into all of that as well. Um, how, what role do you see for each of these kind of three almost distinct planets uh, as we go forward? And how can we, what, what needs to be done to bridge more of these gaps and to have more crosstalk between these different communities? Um. Well, you know, talks like this, I think, are a great start. Um, you know, I think it's it's just a matter of, you know, putting yourself out there, whether you're a scientist or a physician, or um, incorporating it into like the PhD training curriculum and medical student curriculum that they're exposed to patients. Um, you know, you've done a fabulous job of, you know, emailing people and connecting people. Um, so I think it's, I don't think there's enough crosstalk between those three groups. Um, you know, basic scientists are, you know, seem to see a lot of the, um, the problems with how, uh, you know, a drug is translated into a clinical trial and, you know, fundamental differences between the model that's used to justify that trial and then the patients that they're enrolling um, and eventually basing those results on. Um, so I definitely think there, there needs to be more, um, more crosstalk. Um, I know a lot of conferences are starting to involve patients more, which I think is great. Um, patients tend to ask the most tough questions or you know, force us to really think outside the box. So yeah. go ahead, Indu. No, I was just gonna say, um, so I think that you, Ben, have been really a bridge builder. And I know that that's something that you like, you know, have taken on and it's not easy because it's it's a lot of time spent and literally talking to, you know, I feel like I talk to you weekly and you're talking to Megan every day. And, you know, there's so many people that you're connecting, which I think is amazing. And that advocacy work is, is important. And I think you inspire, you know, us to do our work. Um, I do think that these meetings are starting to, you know, have people get together. But I think, you know, with Zoom and these platforms and, you know, unfortunately we had some glitches today, but I think, you know, we can kind of connect many dots that we couldn't before and have, you know, I think, you know, there's certain clinical meetings or certain research meetings and often, you know, people aren't really going to both because there's just not enough time and funding and all these sorts of things. So I think, you know, the World Parkinson Congress, which happens once in three years, has done a great job to connect some of that, but that's a meeting that's, you know, technically once in three years. So I think we have to do this more often and make this sort of maybe even a quarterly thing or something where we can have a dialogue with all three. Um, I think Megan's done a beautiful job actually of breaking things down very, very simply. Um, in the language that she's used today and the slides that she's used and really trying to connect sort of something clinically that's relevant to patients. But I think sometimes it, it just gets so, so esoteric even for me as a clinician, I'm like, I don't, there's just such rapid growth and so many people selling you a story and a new drug that's like, you know, been, you know, tested in this Petri dish that's, that's ready to go. And people then, you know, get hyped up. And, and I think then, you know, we don't really have proper sort of information um, that's really being given to patients and a lot of people get hope and then don't have really the understanding of how, where where it is, how much, how, 10 more years before we can actually use it in patients. And so, so I think these sorts of talks and, and really, you know, I applaud you, Megan, because I know it took you a lot of time and energy to even put the slide deck together and then figure out how to translate it so that, you know, our patients could understand it, um, you know, is huge. So I think we have to have more of these and hopefully patients are hungry. I know I'm hungry to like learn it from, uh, you know, scratch. And I think sometimes even as, as, as scientists to break it down for patients and, and the clinicians to understand sometimes makes you understand it in a, in a different sort of way, because you're so, you know, mm -hmm. in your, in your pocket sort of thinking in these esoteric ways with your own 
five people that you, you know, um, collaborate with in the right. world that having to stay, take that step back and be like, wait, what is, how do the rats look? And how does that, you know, how would a patient think about this? And how would I explain it to my mom or, you know, Dr. Superman? <laughs> so, you know, I, I think it's, it's helpful, you know, to sort of break it down so simply. And sometimes we then see the gaps and see the, the sort of lack of, you know, translation which I think is so important. So I, I think, you know, um, this is just, I think a starting place, but I, I think Ben with the series, we hope to dig deeper and, you know, an hour seems like it's not enough. It just flies by, it seems it like. And, and I think that, you know, <laughs> I'd like to, you know, have you back Megan and, and cover the rest of the slide deck. Cause I think the patients are, are, are waiting to hear this. And I think it's an excellent starting place for people to sort of grasp what what is happening and i think you know sometimes there's sort of a frustration that patients want this and and why is no one listening and you know but i think also <laughs> to see the you you put up the rat uh, with the number 56 presumably there's one to 55 that you had already studied and so i think what what <laughs> is important also i think you you didn't touch on this yet is how much time and diligence and failed attempts go into even just a paper you know and then when you try to apply yes. for a grant how many times do you have to apply it? Maybe you can speak to just that and, um, you know, give, give our patients some inspiration. We have about three minutes left of, um, you know, hope and, and sort of the sort of energetic spend that is your life, but you know, <laughs> what, what the meaning has been through your grandmother's story and what drives you, um, really, I think, and, and sort of just teach us a little bit about the day, a day in the life of you and, and sort of this time spent. Um, so yeah, um, you touched on, you know, all of the important things. I feel like you're in my brain. Um, science does take time. Um, a lot of, a lot of it is spent troubleshooting things or, you know, things that you've done a million times before have suddenly stopped working or you come in and all of your IPOCs have died for some unknown reason. And then you have to troubleshoot 20 different things individually to find out why. Um, so it can be very, very frustrating. Um, and, you know, knowing that there's all of these things that contribute to why Parkinson's is so different between people, you know, we kind of have to make a decision. Um, you know, we have to, to decide, you know, the model is wrong but is it, is it right for this particular application? Um, and so all of these models with all of their faults have taught us a lot about the underlying you know, mechanisms that eventually cause neurodegeneration to happen. But as you can see, there's, there's so many of them here and we can't you know, yet put all of these things into one single animal and you know, find a cure for Parkinson's. So it's, um, what does give me hope, because I feel like a lot of this is, you know, limitations and has a negative outlook. Um, there's a lot of open science initiatives that are happening. Um, uh, and large scale banking of patient derived cells and um, increasing the dialogue with talks like this, um, tweaking previous approaches and technologies advancing at a really rapid pace. Um, so I will, I'll send this out um, or send this to you guys so you can send it out, but there are a lot of great resources out there for, you know, breaking down really complex concepts um, in Parkinson's disease and breaking down a paper um, so the lay person can understand it. And I'm always happy. My email is always open. Um, I'm happy to talk science or whatever. Um, so feel free to contact me. One final question for any people who can stay on um, that I'd love to hear your take on is for any patients that want to get more involved with their local lab or that want to reach out to scientists in their local community, what advice I guess would you have for them in making that contact and making the, that initial, uh, yeah, making that initial contact with their local lab? Um, um, I would say, you know, scientists in general are really happy to talk about their work with people that are not scientists, because we talk to, I spend more time with those people than I do with my family, uh, with with other scientists, right? And like Indu said, you know, it forces you out of your own box to, um, in your own way of thinking, to learn how to explain something to someone who hasn't been studying it for ten years. Um, so, I mean, I really, my best advice would be to just email. 
Um, if you see an article either in the mainstream media, you know, that has a link to who did the study or you find a paper while you're researching, just email, you know, the first author, the last author, their emails are often listed. Um, most likely they are really happy to either send you a copy of the paper if you can't access it, um, and they're really happy to talk to you. Um, ben has a great series of interviews with scientists from all around the world on his blog um, that I found, you know, really enlightening and I go back and listen to all the time because it really, um, it changes my perspective. So I would say just, just email someone, you know, their scientists are really happy to talk about their work, especially with patients. Wow. Well, this hour has flown by and we will have you back for an hour that, or two or more <laughs> people are saying in the, in the chat here. And uh, I agree. Ben's blog inspires me too. I think we're trying to make some of these in video so that we can have a little bit more interaction, but wanted to thank the PMD Alliance for hosting this as usual. And I think, you know, the sort of collaboration with, I think what floats people's boats ultimately is to try to help people. I think that's why people went into right. science, not to write papers, hopefully, right? Um, so I think the collaboration is always key. And, and I think that's why meetings like the WPC and even this, where you can see the faces of all these people whose lives you're impacting by the work that you do and can keep you keeping those cells happy and, and measuring those rat movements, which is <laughs> meticulous. You, you mentioned at the beginning that you're not an, you're such an empath that you can't be a neurologist. Well, I'm not diligent enough and organized enough to be a scientist. So I applaud you for your work, Megan, and all of the scientists that have joined us today. Thank you so much. And uh, um, I'll pass it back to Andrea. So Dr. Duffy, we always uh, say farewell and thank you to our guests with a goodbye wave. So I invite <laughs> everyone, if you've had your camera off, turn it on and Megan scroll through the, the gallery view and just get to see all the smiling faces. You're, you're not in a lab right now and we're so thankful <laughs> that uh, you're, you are doing this good work and for sharing it with us today. So bye everyone and thank bye. you.